moderating group. Um, I'm Miriam Albert, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about the integration of skills and doctrine and how that affects my life and how it may affect your life. <clears throat> and I, don't, I can't tell if I'm the oldest in the room, but if you think back to the 70s, there was a commercial on TV where a young lady was eating peanut butter out of a jar and a young man was eating a chocolate bar. And they bumped into each other in a rather fortuitous way. And the young lady explained, you got chocolate in my peanut butter. And the young man said, no, no, you got peanut butter in my chocolate. And the tagline was, it was two great tastes that taste great together. I teach at a school where many of my colleagues believe the world can actually be divided into pure doctrine and pure skills. I think that is pure fiction, however. You can't, you can't play the game and complain about the rules. So what my job is, as a skills professor who teaches doctrinal and skills classes, follow that, is to try to bring my skills people into my doctrinal world and my doctrinal people into my skills world. So today's exercise showcase for me is to take a case that appears in a business, or it appears in many business organization textbooks, and show you how we can tackle it from a skills perspective, primarily, and a doctrinal perspective. Okay, so we're gonna bridge the gap. <coughs> Sorry, first a little bit about skills versus doctrine, and I should say, in fairness and self-disclosure, when I say skills, I mean transactional business skills. There is a subset of my skills colleagues who think that litigation skills are the sum total of skills. And when we had a two-hour, uh, sorry, a two-day faculty meeting to discuss our skills requirement, it took about a half a day for us to figure out that half of us were talking about transactional skills and half of us were talking about litigation skills. So I, my bias is towards transactional skills. <clears throat> so when I think about teaching students skills, I think about that sort of ephemeral teaching them to think like a lawyer, which was bandied, a lot, bandied around a lot when I was in law school and I wasn't quite sure what it meant. When I got to become a lawyer, I realized that in fact I had not learned how to think like a lawyer and it took quite a while. <clears throat> so, what I, <clears throat> sorry. so what I want to try to teach them is how to think like a lawyer and how to analyze doctrine, and how to bring the practical world into the classroom a little bit. So we think about teaching skills in a private law context by looking at the documents that are the basis of the relationships between these parties. So when I teach contracts, one of the first things I do is show the students a contract. And that is the most amazing moment for them to realize that there actually were real people at a real document, not just a lawyer giving us a summary of just what that lawyer found to be important. Okay, so. But there's also a public law context that I admittedly don't work too much with, the examining of legislation and constitutions, but that also, to me, is part of the doctrinal skills. Why do we teach skills? Most of our students are not going into law teaching, and they're gonna need some practical skills increasingly in this ever-competitive market. When my students take a business drafting class and leave after a semester with a portfolio, the beginnings of their form file, and they've done a shareholders agreement and an employment agreement, and they've set up various forms of business, and they've done an asset purchase agreement. Admittedly, not as well as I would have liked, and not what I would expect if I were their senior partner, but it's an awful lot more than I had when I graduated from law school. I graduated in the late 80s, and <clears throat> I was a summer associate, wined and dined, went to the partner's house for baseball games, and mostly we talked about how pretty and nice I was that summer. That was really the sum total. I came back a semester later, and they asked me to close a deal. And I remember thinking, what do you think I learned in that semester of law school? Because I didn't take that class. I still don't know anything. And so it took me a while to figure out to get precedence and to find somebody to mentor me and to make all of those mistakes. When they take a class like the one that I teach, they do a little bit of that. They front load a little bit of that. My other hope why we teach skills is I can bring people over to the dark side of transactional law. A lot of them still think they want to be litigators. After a semester or a year of contracts with me, after a semester of biz orgs, I can bring a good number of them over to the interesting and challenging part of transactional law. Another reason to teach skills is all our deans are talking about it. If I hear one more word about medical school and how we should do it like the medical schools do it, we're not a medical school. We can learn from what they do, but there are also things that they're doing that are not necessarily uh, applicable to law schools. And the main reason we teach skills are that law deans love to talk about their skills offering. Students love to think their skills. They don't necessarily sign up for all of them, but they want to know that they are available. <clears throat> there are pedagogical reasons, putting aside the practicalities for a second, 
If we understand the underlying documents, it will inform our discussion of the black letter law concepts in a way that has no equal. If we can show them the actual provision that the parties are fighting about and put it in a broader context, they will get more out of the discussion. So if we can concretize the situation, it also makes the learning more accessible to different kinds of learners. There's a lot of talk these days about how people learn and you know, people that are more visual learners and more uh, people that like group work and are millennials and we're catering to all of these different differences in our populations. And if we change up how we teach it a little bit, the odds are if we cast a broader net, we're gonna catch more people. So what I want to talk about is a particular case that shows up in the BizOrgs book that I use. It's Benihana of Tokyo versus Benihana. Now, why did I pick this case? It has, because I'm gonna to demonstrate to you, I hope, how you could teach it with a doctrinal slant and how you could teach it as a skill slant. So my BizOrgs friends can use the skills piece of it and bring that in, and my skills people can use the BizOrgs piece of it and bring the doctrine in. What's nice about the case is that it is straightforward, but it's juicy. We have intrigue, we have a beauty queen, we have an interfamily squabble. It has a very clear drafting inconsistency. So even folks in the absolute beginning of their drafting career will be able to see this inconsistency. There is a correct judicial interpretation of the, in of the inconsistency, and everyone enjoys, not everyone, but most people enjoy hibachi cooking, and everyone enjoys a family squabble. That's why we watch Oprah, we, that's why we watch soap operas, we look at that and we think, wow, someone is worse off than me. This guy has all the money in the world, and he is worse off than me. So here's a slide, just to show you that I know how to copy and paste a picture, I put that in there. Plus my kids insist that we go to Benihana, they like when the guy flips the shrimp into his hat. I don't know that it's worth 30 bucks a person, but it certainly gets a smile on their little faces. Okay, so who are our cast of characters? We have Rocky, who is the aging protagonist, the Jerry Curl founder of Benihana. So he comes to New York in 1959. He's a member of the Japanese Olympic wrestling team. He's about this big, so I don't get how that happens, but maybe they don't have a lot to choose from. He drives a truck in Harlem selling ice cream, and he decides to open his first hibachi grill. After many failed relationships, he marries the lovely Kiko Ono, who is a former Miss Tokyo, third wife, who is, and you can see her, she's cooking in the kitchen, she's very beautiful. She doesn't, when you look at her, not to be stereotypical, you don't think CEO material from this picture, right? You think, okay, she's cooking, she's lovely. She is disliked by his six loving children who believe that their new mommy is out to take their inheritance, which in fact turns out to be true. Page six gets involved. For the non-New Yorkers in the crowd, page six is the gossip page in uh, the New York Post. And so we have the lawsuits filed in Delaware, but it's really being played out of the New York gossip pages. Here's a little quip. The fight over the Benihana fortune is getting nastier. Last Monday night, our spy saw the Aoki clan, including Dev and Kyle and Echo, three of the kids, at a Benihana eatery on West 56th Street, fighting horribly over money and how Benihana was being run. It was a very heated discussion. The children were in tears and begging their father to contact them and pick up the phone when they call. Okay, we know none of that is true, right? We know the kids whose family owns the restaurant are not eating at the restaurant, there's no way. And we know that they're not fighting horribly over the money and we know they're not having a heated discussion in the ear range of a newspaper reporter, but it's potentially believable if we just sort of imagine the Hollywood version of it. Okay, now a little more about him. He had a little bit of a complicated life. He had many, many mistresses and he once boasted that he had three children the same age born to three different women. That fact is horrifying enough, and the fact that he boasted about it is somewhat problematic, but that gives you a sense of the personality that we have here. You should not be surprised to know that his character carried over into his business dealings. He had tax evasion issues and had a little problem with the government on some insider trading that he settled out of court with what was then a very big fine, and as a result, he had to step down running this publicly traded company, and he had to put all of the stock that he owned into a trust. And that's where we see ourselves, because he owned 100% of it until this action. So he puts it in a trust. The trustees are three kids and a guy named Darvin Dornbush, who is the family attorney, he's on the board, and he's essentially the general counsel. Okay, as you may imagine, Rocky, in love with Miss Tokyo, changes his will, and he gives her control over the trust, the Benihana Trust. 
Her background in business is non-existent. She has a skill. She was Miss Tokyo, so she, I don't know if she twirled or if she did something, but she definitely had some sort of talent. It didn't necessarily demonstrate itself in a track record in business. So the kids flip out over her new role, and the president and CEO, to put it mildly, had some concerns. He speaks to our friend Dornbush, who, remember, is general counsel, family attorney, and a member of the trust, and they brainstorm ideas. Now, at the same time that they're concerned about Miss Tokyo taking over should Rocky perish, Benihana restaurants were in desperate need of refurbishing. They all had that sort of fully amortized look. Turning over restaurant <laughs> is an expensive proposition, so they need to bring in money. So we have a control freak with a tax evasion conviction or settlement who is not allowed to own the company but is really calling the shots and has moved his now bride into the shotgun position. We need money. He wants control, doesn't really have control. The kids are in the restaurant crying. No one's taking phone calls. It's a big mess. So they start to bring in financing people to try to figure out different ways to raise money to make the restaurants a little shinier, a little brighter, so people will continue, as I do, to spend $30 to see a guy flip shrimp into his hat. Okay, so those are our facts. At the time of the lawsuit, what did the trust own? There are two classes of stock, and in Visors, we've already covered common stock and preferred stock, so this is fitting seamlessly in. In my drafting class, which requires Visors as a prerequisite, I'm reviewing, I say reviewing in the hopes that it is a review, not a view, but you never know what they pay attention to. We have two classes of stock. We have common stock of the operator, the subsidiary, that's entitled to elect the lion's share of the directors. They get one vote a share. There's also 2% of other common stock, which is entitled to elect just 25% of the directors, and they each have one-tenth of a vote per share. So in the process of this reorganization, the trust attempts to issue preferred stock that has preemptive rights. I don't want to cause post-traumatic stress syndrome for anyone who had a problem with biz orgs, but do you guys remember what preemptive rights are? Preemptive rights are the right to buy your proportional share of a new issue. Okay, so if I own a chunk of stock that has preemptive rights attached to it, if the corporation is going to issue more of that stock, they have to ask me first. I don't have to buy it, but I may. And if I choose to exercise this option, I'm keeping my ownership level stable. If I choose not to exercise the option, I'm going to get diluted. So when you see someone in a majority position and they get diluted out, they change from being the person that everybody needed in the room to someone that nobody cares about, and that can be traumatic for people. So the issue in the case, according to the court, is whether Benny Hanna was authorized to issue this $20 million in preferred stock, and then whether the board acted properly in approving the transaction. That, whether the board acted properly in approving the transaction, is a classic biz org's duty of loyalty, fiduciary care, business judgment rule that doesn't necessarily translate into drafting. That said, the issue of preferred stock is a clear drafting issue. So I had the opportunity to take the case in two different directions, depending on my population. Okay, so here was an example of preferred stock, I'm sorry, preemptive rights, and it's a chance, as I said, for me to review it with the kids in the drafting class, and then we're gonna actually draft it. So if you own 500 shares, you're a majority shareholder, if they issue another 1,000, you're gonna be diluted. Gives you a little reminder of what preemptive rights are. The court looks at all of this and says, before addressing the director's conduct and motivation, which speaks to the duty of loyalty issue, we must decide whether Benny Hanna's certificate of incorporation authorized the board to issue the preferred stock with preemptive rights. So before we get to what they did with the preemptive, with the preferred stock, we have to figure out whether the preferred stock that they issued was actually valid. So here is a, just an example of a certificate of incorporation that is fantastically not clear and pretty much illegible, so that's not super useful. But the reason I'm giving it to you is because it does not have in it a provision that, that gives preemptive rights to the stock. Preemptive rights is something that has to show up in the certificate of incorporation in order for it to attach to the stocks. So for the most part, this is the first time my students in BizOrgs have seen a certificate of incorporation. We've talked about them, we've seen cases about them, but now they see, oh my gosh, this thing actually exists. 
And what I can do, and I don't have time today, but what I can do is go through the sections of it and show them how it maps onto the New York Business Corporation law or the Delaware law. So they see not only that this exists, but where it comes from and why it makes sense and why it exists. So this was a Delaware corporation, so we used the Delaware statute. The Delaware statute has two different provisions. It tells you what has to go in a certificate of incorporation and it tells you what can go in a certificate of incorporation. You must provide for the capitalization of at least one class of voting stock, and then I have the <coughs> language of the statute. And you may provide the preemptive right to subscribe to any additional issues of stock. So you must have a class of common voting stock. It may be preempted if you would like. Then I've underlined for emphasis the end of the statute. No stockholder shall have any preemptive rights to subscribe to additional issues of stock or to any security convertible unless and except to the extent that it's expressly granted in the Certificate of Incorporation. So the statute clearly tells us that if you want preemptive rights to attach to this class of stock, you better say so in your certificate of incorporation. So you can imagine from a drafting point of view, what we're going to look at now is whether Benihana's certificate of incorporation provided, authorized the board to have these pre uh, preemptive rights or not. And here comes the drafting conflict. Benihana's articles of incorporation say in paragraph four, no stockholder shall have any preemptive rights to subscribe to or purchase any stock of the corporation. That feels pretty clear. That feels pretty unambiguous, right? So if it's clear and unambiguous, what's our interpretation rule? It has to be given its plain meaning. So you're reading that, you're thinking they can't issue preemptive rights. It's just not allowed. You press on in their articles of incorporation and it says preferred stock of any series, blah, 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 if designation preference and relative participant. Uh, in, so this provision tells us that you can, it's a blank check provision that says the board can do what it wants, presumably including the authorization of preemptive rights. So this feels clear and unambiguous as well. So we have two different provisions in the same certificate of incorporation, one that says no preemptive rights, and one that seemingly, albeit implicitly, seems to authorize preemptive rights. So the conflict that we have is that under paragraph two, no stockholder is entitled to preemptive rights. Under paragraph 4B, it seems the board is authorized to issue preferred stock with various preferences, including preemptive rights. So as a drafting mechanism, I get to look with the students at the certificate of incorporation and show them this conflict. The judge looks at the conflict and says, if there is an ambiguity, which we have here, the language must be construed in a manner that will harmonize the apparent conflict and give effect to the intent of the drafter. So now the court is saying, we see that one is saying yes and one is saying no. We're going to take a look and see whether what the intent of the drafter was. The trial court finds that the language in Article 4, Paragraph 2, no stockholder is entitled to preemptive rights, the court says merely confirms that no stockholder has preemptive rights under common law. As a result, the seemingly absolute language in paragraph two has no bearing on the availability of contractually created preemptive rights in 4B. So the court says all that's happening in that first paragraph is a restatement of the common law presumption that shareholders do not have preemptive rights. The way that it used to work, the legislative history of this section indicated that way back when there was a presumption that shareholders had preemptive rights unless it was stated otherwise. And they amended the Delaware, uh, the Delaware laws in like the 60s, I want to say, in the late 60s, and they said it's the opposite. So the presumption was you had to state them, otherwise you didn't have them, and the Delaware presumption now is reversed. So the court views this first provision that says no preemptive rights are available as a corporation including boilerplate language in their charter to clarify that no shareholder possessed preemptive rights under the common law. Seems a little crazy, why would you put it in there? What tends to happen is you have a boilerplate way that you set up a certificate of incorporation, nobody thought about it. And when they went to do the preemptive rights, they just looked at the section that gave them blank check approval and they used that. So what, this gives me a chance to show the students the danger and pitfall of using a boilerplate language. 
and that now we had to bring it to a judge. The court says the blank check provision in the Certificate of Incorporation suggests that the certificate was never intended to limit Benny Hanna's ability to issue preemptive rights. Could you make the argument the other way that the first section that says there are no preemptive rights reflects Benny Hanna's intent that there be no preemptive rights? Because of the judicial history, because of the legislative history, the court decides to disregard that first provision. So they read the second paragraph, 4.2, to confirm the common law presumption that it doesn't apply. So what do we get to do with something like this? This kind of case and this kind of sub-issue in a biz orgs class gives me a jumping off point to talk about the content of the Certificates of Incorporation, the consequences of drafting choices in this case, the consequences of drafting choices on a more broad level, and to get into the idea of a Certificate of Designation, how you pull rights and, um, uh, what's another word, how you get the rights and, um, how you get the rights, let's stick with that, for um, preferred stock. The bells and whistles that you want to put on your class of preferred stock, how it gets you into the idea of the certificate of designation. So I have the opportunity to teach preemptive rights in a doctrinal context and in a skills-based context. So that is my magic trick for you guys. We show them going forward, how could we have avoided this, which is what I spend a lot of time in contracts. We read the contract, we read the provision. The judge says they did a bad job. A neat question that law students never want to think about is, how could this have been avoided? Because if it was avoided, we wouldn't have a nice case to read. This could have been avoided if they said in the beginning, unless otherwise provided herein, you don't have preemptive rights. It would have been consistent and it would have worked. That would have required somebody to read this five-line certificate of incorporation and think about it, which doesn't always happen when you deal with boilerplates. So that's my little exercise for you. Oh, should we do questions at the end, or did anybody have questions? It was that good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Mom, I'm over, and we'll uh, save some time at the end to come back. I think you did. is Lene Espenscheid, and I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Georgia, where I teach a class on contract drafting. I'm the author of this book on contract drafting that uh, was published earlier this year by the American Bar, and um, this is the, the material, um, this is the book that I use in my class. Actually, I wrote the book out of the materials that I had devised um, for my class, and um, I have the uh, the honor today to be the next to the last presenter, <laughs> uh, which is an interesting thing on a, on a Saturday afternoon. Um, and I'm, I'm really honored that y'all are all here. I wondered if I would be speaking to the other speakers when the time came. <laughs> so I'm glad you're here. Um, and I know that I've gained many insights just from attending um, this uh, conference. I attended two years ago, and it's really remarkable to me how much progress has been made uh, in this area. And one thing that I really love about getting to go last uh, in, in a situation like this is kind of pulling together the little threads of the other topics and the other presenters and things that we um, talked about. Um, one thing that I really loved uh, in Tina's opening comments, which are always so well thought out and she's um, so meticulous about it, but um, one thing that I really uh, appreciated in her comments was the whole concept of trying to decide what it is that we're going to teach and in what order and how it is that we um, go about it. And um, so my 15 minutes of fame today is uh, talking about the demonstrating the allocation of risk. And since I am teaching strictly a drafting class, um, my uh, fact patterns are a little bit less intricate and a little uh, less involved than what um, Miriam uh, had presented. But um, Miriam, I have to caution you against using the word herein. 
in the drafting if okay. that's considered to be ambiguous. So you may have saw, jumped out of the fire and out of the frying pan right into the fire. Not a full employment actor, <laughs> the future generation of lawyers. So um, talking about demonstrating the allocation of risk, that's sort of a tall order for a, a short time frame, but I'll try to throw out a, a few ideas um, that maybe you can use. I hope so anyway. Um, and the first thing that I wanted to share with you was sort of my approach to teaching um, contract drafting because I think that you need to understand what my approach is in order to understand how these exercises actually play into um, the class that I teach. Um, I'm mindful, very mindful of uh, Richard Newman's presentation yesterday, which was pretty awesome um, and also very intimidating. I don't know how many of you were in there, but he talked about uh, how we think we know so much and really what we do know is tiny, a tiny fraction of what it was that we thought that we knew. And one of the things that he particularly brought up is that we're all uh, sort of limited by our experience of one. And so um, I say this uh, with all humility that I, I am, uh, you know, I do have the experience of one. My experience is uh, deep. I graduated from law school 25 years ago. And it's also broad um, because I've worked in a uh, big eight accounting firm and I'm dating myself <laughs> by saying I don't know how many there are today uh, accounting firms, but yeah, uh, at the time I worked at uh, Ernst & Young actually before I went to law school and worked with many lawyers there. Um, I worked with a large national law firm for a few years. I actually was in-house counsel. Uh, at a Fortune 500 company for a couple of years. And then, as my son was born, I opened my own practice where I focused on uh, smaller representations of moms and pops. And uh, I'm uh, happy to say my son is now 18 years old, so, and on his way off to school. And um, I started teaching contracts um, sometime along in that process. I teach also at law firms and um, in law departments. So, um, my philosophy on teaching contract drafting, though, is based on this experience, is this. I've never yet encountered a first-year lawyer, or even a second-year lawyer, for that matter, um, structuring or negotiating a very complex um, contract. I, I have not, and the, you know, in my, in my humble uh, experience of one, um, I think that part of the reason for that is uh, the potential liability for the employers um, if they were to send untested, untried, and untrained um, people out to negotiate really sophisticated contracts. Um, what I do notice first year associates doing is drafting, and a lot of drafting. And so it seems to me um, that I focus my course, my specific course, on drafting because I want to be sure that my students have a very clear understanding of what is expected um, in, in drafting when they enter law practice. That's not to say that I don't think the other concepts should be taught in law school. I certainly do. Um, negotiating and structuring transactions are a very important part of our education, but I think um, that drafting uh, you know, is sort of the fundamental baseline. And in order to get to the point in a law practice where you would need to have the other skills, uh, you gotta master it first. Um, because if you can't handle the drafting out of the gate, you're probably not gonna get promoted to the point where you'd have that kind of responsibility. So, um, that's, that's sort of my bent on it. And so, we think about how drafting is done, and of course, all of you who've practiced uh, realize that we do very little zero-based drafting. Most of what we do, we start with the document from a prior draft, and we're gonna edit and refine and modify those provisions to fit the current transaction. So um, the way that I teach in my classes, I usually give my students a lot of facts, and there are you know, a lot of unique twists and turns and things that they're not going to uh, go out on the internet and find. What, what was the, uh, the extruder I think somebody was using yesterday? The, the goop mm -hmm. extruder? <laughs> Well, my facts are not quite that out there, but they're pretty out there. Uh, and so, you know, it's going to require my students to do um, some original drafting in order to, um, to convert, uh, you know, the, the language that they've been given to the facts and circumstances that they're given. 
And um, as I understand it, there, there's still, even though we've come so far in the past couple of years, I still uh, sense um, some resistance in certain law schools, um, and certainly even in the state, uh, even though Emory is doing a fantastic job leading the way with Tina and everything in her programs. Are, are leading the way, but there's still some resistance on uh, campuses about teaching um, transactional skills. And I think that part of it is based on the assumption um, that, you know, there's the think like a lawyer model, and somehow that uh, transactional skills don't require any thinking. And actually, nothing could be further from the truth. If you think about um, teaching litigation skills, for example, argument in moot court, brief writing and all of that, one of the fundamental components of this is teaching the students to differentiate between the facts in this case, um, the law that's applicable in this case, teaching them to differentiate. And that's absolutely what I do in my class. I want them to think critically about the language that they inherit um, when they start their practices, the language that they're given to work with. I want them to um, think about whether it has been drafted properly to begin with, whether it's applicable to the current transaction, and whether it allocates risk successfully among the parties the way that, um, you know, the way that it should be. So um, thinking critically, like Miriam, Miriam was talking about bringing uh, skills into critical thinking classes, um, I have also a critical thinking class, and um, I think it's very, very important. Um, so, for, for purposes of our discussion today, there, there are a couple of other things that I handle with my class, first of all. Uh, but the, the starting point is going to be the language that they're given to work from. Okay, that, that's where we're starting. And they're going to um, mark up a contract. Um, and the first point that I get to, the, get to make with them is start from a winning position. And this is actually better stated in the negative, which is to say don't start from a losing position. Um, it's not that you have to score a slam dunk in every, uh, every provision that's written, but you don't want to ever start from a negative position. And the caveat here is uh, model rule 102, 1.2 scope of res representation. We have to throw this out there to begin with. A lawyer shall abide by a client's decisions concerning the objectives of representation and shall consult with the client as to the means by which they are to be pursued. So um, I've worked with, over the years, uh, some very uh, aggressive um, um, uh, lawyers and, and in-house departments that have very, very um, one-sided approaches to negotiation. Um, very aggressive. Every provision has to be as far in their favor as it can possibly be drawn. Um, Ford comes to mind. I worked on it. I have to say, um, I didn't represent Ford, so I, I'm free to disclose to you that they're by far the hardest negotiators that I ever encountered in my practice, and I, and I usually worked with uh, software and um, intellectual property. On the other hand, I did a transaction once uh, with Bell South, which um, is a predecessor of AT&T here in town, a, a subsidiary uh, company of AT&T. And they actually had quite a paternalistic approach to their small business partners. Um, they were very accommodating. They didn't want to stretch the envelope. Uh, they wanted kind of an I'm okay, you're okay kind of a feel to the contract when it was done, a very paternalistic approach. And um, so what I teach my students to begin with is we have to abide by their decisions. What is their policy? How do they approach the negotiations uh, with their business partners? But even within that, you're never going to start from a losing position. It may mean that you move more to a neutral position, but you're not in a negative position. And I'll show you a little bit um, as I do them. Uh, uh, and, and let me just walk through this as if I would be teaching a class because I think that's uh, um, an easier way to do it. One point that I try to make is that every sentence, just about every sentence in a contract, of course, can be written so that it favors one party or the other or that it's more neutral. There's a, there's a wide range in between. And every sentence that is there in the document they're working from can be written one way or the other. 
And so the first thing we do is we try to identify what is a winning position in this case, okay? And we're looking to see who has the risk and where we want to put the risk um, with this provision. So when you look at the first sentence, seller shall deliver the goods on or before July 31, who has the risk in this provision? The seller. The seller. In order to comply with the contract, there's no wiggle room. The goods have to be there on or before July 31st. And so you see then how the risk starts to shift. And you get to the last example, which is to say, seller will attempt to deliver the goods on or before July 31. Okay, and in this case, we see obviously the risk has shifted almost entirely to the buyer because all the seller has to do is attempt. And once they've made an attempt, they're done, you know, and it doesn't matter. The seller, I mean the buyer, excuse me, if they need the goods on a certain day, they're at risk. The risk has been allocated more toward the buyer in that situation. So when I say start from a winning position, if you're representing a client that has a more touchy-feely, paternalistic approach to its business partners, you might start, let's see, is there a little laser? Oops, no laser. Oh, there's the laser, good. <laughs> you might start right about here, you know, or maybe here, somewhere about here. But you don't start here if you're representing the buyer, even if they're touchy-feely, because this is a losing position for the buyer. This is a putting the buyer at a disadvantage. Okay, and so in my class, as I'm teaching this concept, we usually walk through um, two or three of these um, warranties. Seller warrants that the goods will conform to buyer specifications. Who has the risk there? <coughs> Obviously, the seller has the risk, and it's actually quite a broad risk because there's no materiality restrictions on it, and the buyer specifications are not even nailed down. So presumably the buyer can change specifications from time to time during the contract. And so the seller, you see, has taken on a large degree of risk. And then we walk down one example after another. These are all different ways that the same sentence could be written, or the same provision could be written, um, and we get to the bottom, which is to say, no warranty, we're disclaiming all warranties under this agreement. All of them, we're exclaiming all. Um, and this is a very interesting um, provision. This is actually how I ever came to the conclusion that this concept needed to be taught. Um, you know, I've worked on the high-level finance documents, the high-level corporate documents that receive a lot of scrutiny from very sophisticated lawyers working in very sophisticated law firms. But it's the stuff below that, below the line, um, that uh, has more to do with the day-to-day -day operations that sometimes comes under the radar and receives very little scrutiny. And the lawyers or whoever wrote the contract just pick up language because they see it and it makes sense. And, oh, that sounds good, I'll throw that in there. I need some sort of a warranty provision, so I'll just zap this in. And so what I'm teaching my students is to critically think, how did this language get in here? Um, especially with the warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. Think of that. The buyer has asked, specifically asked the seller whether this product is appropriate or this good or this, you know, whatever is appropriate. Um, if you're representing the buyer, why would you ever start from a position where you've disclaimed this warranty? There's really very little uh, reason why you would. The one reason that I have encountered is that we simply don't want to waste time negotiating these contracts. Okay, so I have seen that in practice. But um, so I'm just raising these issues with my students, walking them through one at a time, um, and we go through several examples because my point is that just about every sentence that's in the document that you're working from can be written to favor one or the other. Now, it's not so difficult. Law students are real sharp. They get it real quickly. And when they see these provisions side by side by side, they can figure out who has the risk. They can figure out how it shifts. So the next thing that I like to do in my class would be to start, um, I wonder what you know, this slide isn't dimming out. But you can start like right about here and just put this provision up on the PowerPoint or whatever opinion of the council reasonably satisfactory to the company. Who does this favor? Where is the risk? 
How would you take it up a notch if you wanted to um, make it more difficult for the selling party? This is probably from a, a partnership agreement, selling shareholder agreement, something like that. Um, how would you take it up a notch if you wanted it to be more favorable to the company? How would you take it down a notch if you wanted it to be more favorable to the selling party, whoever um, is uh, uh, subject to this? And let them think about that and let them come up with their ideas of, you know, thinking critically, okay, how would I write this to make it favor one party or the other a little bit more or a little less? Okay. Um, and here's just another example of the same um, type of thing. Um, I want to show you uh, this. Um, exercise that I give them once they've kind of gotten the hang of identifying the risk and, and they're, they're getting the idea of how it is that we allocate risk. Then I'll give this exercise, which is to just require them to imagine the whole thing, to make it up, to create the language. Identify the range of risk for an indemnification provision, beginning more favorable to the buyer and ending more favorable to the seller. Okay, so now they have to think. Um, and if they're doing it in class, you know, they don't usually have many resources to consult while they're in class. So they're, they're actually, you know, exercising their brains as they're uh, working through. Okay. And of course, I think we would come up with something very simple like this. Seller shall indemnify and defend the buyer against any claim. Seller shall indemnify to the extent caused. And of course, we know that, you know, the to the extent caused is what brings in our proximate cause limitations. In drafting, and so those those uh, four little words have a huge consequence in terms of liability. Um, and then you know you sort of shift out the bottom there, uh, reciprocal provision. Okay, I'll indemnify you, you indemnify me, and then buyer shall indemnify and defend seller. Forget it, seller's not providing indemnification in this agreement. You know, so you, you can see the range of risk shifting from one party to the other. And then um, the, the next level, taking it up, just one more notch. Uh, where is the next level? Who has the greater risk in this provision? Um, representative shall indemnify company from any and all claims, damages, or lawsuits, including reasonable attorney's fees, arising out of or related to representatives, what? Fraud, misrep, or negligence? or a violation of any applicable law or government regulation. So I throw this up and I let them think about it. And guess what? This is sort of a trick question, isn't it? Um, for those of us who've you know, practiced and dra drafted many of these provisions, we realize that it seems sort of one way, but it's actually more another, isn't it? Um, but this is how I use exercises in my drafting class to uh, teach critical thinking skills. Um, in this instance, of course, the represent, representative is providing a pretty broad um, degree of indemnification, but it's in a very narrow circumstance, only in the instances of fraud and misrepresentation or violation of law. And so then the next step would be to ask the students to um, devise a provision, you know, that shifts the risk one way or the other, okay? And so this is just an example of, um, I like really to incorporate critical thinking skills in all of the exercises that uh, we use in class. I love to teach by Socratic method. It may be just, uh, you know, some sort of a, uh, I, I don't know, a malicious uh, <laughs> street, <laughs> evil streak that I have, but I think that it does, um, keep them on their toes and they do think a lot harder when they're um, engaged in something like this. So, okay. Our, uh, one of our speakers couldn't make it today. Something unexpected came up. Um, so I'm the, I'm the last one. My materials are last. 
And actually, um, the materials, there's like PowerPoint, and then there's just a few pages at the back. The few pages at the back are exactly what the PowerPoint slides are. Um, so you can use either format, whatever is easier for you to read. I certainly don't, um, don't have a preference. I've been going back and forth over here um, this whole presentation, trying to decide which one I was going to use up here or whether I was going to use the PowerPoint at all. Um, when I found out I was going to be doing the exercise showcase part, um, I, I sort of stepped back and thought, what do I do that maybe um, I do and nobody else does, or that I do maybe a little differently than, than other people? And so I guess I should tell you, I've been teaching 22 years. I've taught contracts that entire time. I feel like I own contracts, OK? Um, I teach PR as well, and I've taught that almost as long. And about six or seven years ago, there was a couple of us on the faculty who got the wild idea that maybe we needed some sort of applica application course with regard to contracts. And we started talking about contract drafting. And um, you know, in the game of musical chairs, everybody else ran for the chair, and I didn't, OK? <laughs> um, I actually thought it would be a great productive endeavor that I would enjoy, and I have, OK? But I consider it, I've taught it now, I believe, six times. Um, and it's an evolving course for me still. Um, I've used four different sets of material. Some, every year, some of the material is my own. Some of it's you know, from whatever. Right now, I'm using Tina Stark's book. Um, but I've, you know, I've kind of gone through all the sources and looked at everything and you know, done the woe is me um, over and over again. So, so what I have is I have this back, this contracts background, and I, yeah, <laughs> new book. Um, I have this contracts background, and I have this PR background, and um, I try to bring both of those aspects into the course um, for my drafting students. Now, I teach at Louisville, and Louisville is small. Our entering class is about 140 students. We have two sections, which means I teach half of the first year. Um, for a whole year for contracts. So I know them really well. And then I teach half of the, well, I teach a fourth of the second and third years because my PR class tends to be a, a blend of second and third years. But what, what I'm trying to get at is by the time of graduation, there are a few people that walk across that um, stage that I haven't had in class, okay? And my drafting class um, is capped at 18 students. And it tends to be third years because we do it on a priority system, and the third years all register, you know, get the priority. Um, so, you know, it tends to be third years. I tend to know most of them beforehand. You know, I kind of have an idea of where they're coming from. Um, I also, it also allows me, as as you were saying about review, um, I know what's a review, <laughs> um, or what should be a review, because I know we've done it together in the past. Um, but what I do in the contracts courses, I actually do spend quite a bit of time going over things like representations and warranties because I know they had them in the first year, that whole concept, the concept of a representation, the concept of a warranty. Um, but, you know, in a different context, in a drafting context, they don't know how to deal with it. And so I spend a lot of time trying to bridge that gap. Um, and I've really worked on that, you know, in, in terms of the drafting class evolving. I've really worked on that kind of thing. Um, you know, the merger clause, okay? You know, it, talking to them about, now, what does this make you think about? Anybody remember parole evidence, you know, and, and going through that whole conversation about why we're talking about a merger clause? Um, so I've, I've done that. Um, but recently, I've been thinking about, um, things that are lacking in the drafting class conversation. And OK, I'm, I'm in front of the class, and I know who in there has had PR. I have a pretty good idea of who's had PR and who hasn't. And so I know that they should have certain awarenesses with regard to context, professional context. But I'm not seeing it. And so what I, um, you know, a couple of, I know Tina's book and a couple other books, they, they kind of do a chapter on the ethics relating to drafting. And in Tina's book, it hits this last chapter, or make, one of the last chapters, OK? Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I toyed with the whole thing of the, the idea of do you do a chapter, you know, all one class on, on ethics, or do you try to sprinkle it along? 
And what I finally figured out is you need to have a conversation early in the semester. And by having that conversation early in the semester, a sneaky conversation, okay, where yes, we're talking about ethics, but it's not the day that we talk about ethics, right? Um, but if we have that sneaky conversation early, um, it helps raise the awareness throughout and we can have some more um, involved conversations later as other issues pop up in context of problems that we're working on, drafting issues and such. And so, okay, so I'm, I'm thinking, all right, I wanna, I wanna put in some, some, um, some material to kind of raise awareness. What, what do I do early in the semester? What could possibly help? And what I landed on, um, uh, even before I did this, you started using the Starks book, um, Tina Starks book, um, I started, I, one of the earliest exercises that I would do related to an employment agreement, okay? And, you know, a corporation who's hiring some executive and um, we're representing the executive, um, a simple set of facts that the students could get their heads around. And um, I did not practice transactional law, but I had several friends, including my husband, that um, long ago were transactional um, associates and it seemed like my husband always got stuck with that, with that particular task, drafting, drafting um, you know, the executives and executives contract. And so, you know, I'd kind of uh, been around and around on exactly what was going on with all of that. So what I do is very early in the semester, I try to tackle the issue of representing, um, of corporate representation in general, and in particular, in the context of that employment agreement setting, okay? Um, and so what I did was I basically took some of my um, now partner buddies out a couple of times for lunch, you know, and picked their brains in terms of, well, how does this come up? What, you know, is this real? Is this not real in terms of context? So here's the, here's the problem. And, you know, what, I, what I'm trying to do for you all is... Um, give you something that you can take back and maybe tinker with yourself to make it your own, um, but use it to kind of get at some of these issues so as to just raise the, the class awareness, okay, and change some of the conversation. Um, so what I do is I, I hand the students an email from, you know, senior partner, um, Adam, and, you know, Adam says, okay, Callie over at Wings and More has called um, and asked for our help in drafting a new employment contract for Dan. All right, so um, our client is Wings and More. We know Callie's there. We're going to be dealing with an employment contract for Dan. As you know, Callie is an assistant general counsel at Wings and More and handles all of the human relations matters. Um, Dan is the present general counsel. Now, how many alarms are going off in any of you, any of you who have, have, have been in that kind of practice situation? Um, you know how no lawyer wants to be anywhere near any of that, right? Because it's just fraught with problems. But okay, so Dan's the present general counsel and he's the one that we're going to be doing the employment agreement, or, or he's not gonna be our, our client, but his employment agreement is what we're going to be doing. Um, you know Dan, you and I have dealt with Dan on a plethora of matters for Wings and More over the last several years. So okay, we know we have a relationship and the firm has a relationship. I've been especially pleased at the rapport you have built between you and Dan and the lawyers working under Dan. That's that, you know, partner under my thumb thing that all associates have to have. You know, it's in the email or it's in that message on the phone, you know, that you pick up at eight at night and it's like, Ugh. Um, so Implicit in that is if you screw it up, you know, um, I've grown comfortable with the thought that you understand the care and tending necessary to keep an important client like Wings and More satisfied and in the law firm fold. So for obvious reasons, our contact on this matter is not Dan, but Callie. Callie says the terms of this contract should mirror Dan's last contract with, my, with a minor change. So okay, it looks like we're just gonna be creating another document pretty much like we just had um, governing dance employment, that shouldn't be too awful. 
But Dan's current contract had a term of five years, and Callie now wants the new agreement to have a two-year term for whatever reason. One can imagine maybe Dan's getting, a, getting on in years. Maybe there, there, there's already some conversation about um, what direction they want to go after Dan, post-Dan. Dan's going to represent himself in the matter. Um, please assist Callie in taking care of this. Call me if you need me. Okay. Um, so I said, you know, that's the email. That's how it, how the, the problem is, is set up. Um, in your handout, you'll see I, I start out. Okay, I'm using the model rules of professional conduct. Most jurisdictions are pretty darn close in terms of their own rules. And I, I provide to the students, okay, background noise. Background noise is rule 1.1, um, which is our competence rule, basic rule of competence. Okay, we know we're going to be operating. We're going to represent Wins and Moore. Our contact is Cali. We've got, we owe a duty of competence. That shouldn't be a problem, okay? Um, but we also have the background noise of rule 1.4, communication with the client. We know that we have to, um, and, and the gist of 1.4, it's divided in several parts, but the gist of 1.4 is we have to stay in contact with our client, we have to consult with our client, um, you know, obtain, obtain you know, our client's uh, uh, ideas about everything. So we have this, this duty to communicate, um, keep the client reasonably informed, promptly comply with reasonable requests for information, all that sort of thing. Um, part five, tell the client you can't do something if the client wants you to do something unethical. Um, and explain a matter to the extent reasonably necessary to permit the client to make informed decisions regarding the representation. Now at this point, after I've kind of said, okay, here's the background, you know, the, the noise, um, we talk about what that means in the context of a corporate representation. If Callie's our contact, you know, what do we do? Are we talking to Callie often? You know, how is this conversation going to, going to take place? And usually there's somebody in the class who has had another life, who has seen this or seen something like it or has some idea. Or maybe they worked as a summer associate and been pulled along to something. So they have some ideas about how this communication might work. Okay, so we draft an employment agreement in accordance with Callie's instructions. And Callie approves the draft. We send it over to Dan. And Dan calls and he tells us that in light of the shorter term, he would like the agreement to contain a severance package, that is the shorter term from five years to two, that he would like the agreement to contain a severance patch package in the event Wings and Moore chooses not to employ him after the conclusion of the two-year contract term. So he wants a little bit, bit more on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the end. So we talk to Callie about it, and note that Dan calls us, right? He calls Ben, the associate, and here I'm a little bit schizo because I'm narrating, I'm, I'm trying to explain to you how I facilitate, but I'm also in some respects trying to be you, be the student, right? Um, so Dan calls us, and you might say, well, why would Dan call us? Why doesn't he call Callie? Because Dan knows us, right? There's that connection there. Dan's used to calling us. You know, Dan's used to calling and asking a question or two. Um, so Callie says, well, okay, we can keep the cost low. Um, you know, draft a low-ball approach to the severance package. What do you think? Draft a low-ball approach to the severance package. What's popping into your mind at this point? What do you see? Go ahead. Who's your client? Okay, who's your client? And the, you know, the interesting thing, even students who have had PR, okay, and there again, I can attest that I've seen their smiling faces somewhere <laughs> else, okay? Um, even students who have had PR often are confused about who the client is, okay? You know, they want to say Callie's the client, and I'm always careful to say, well, Callie's the agent of the client. Or some will say, well, Dan's a client too, okay? And so we spend a lot of time right there early in the class with that because most of the exercises later in the class, it's corporate representation, you know? Maybe it's a sale of assets or whatever, and they need to understand how that works, that relationship works between agent of client and 
you know, all the other parties that might be playing around there. Um, what else do you see? In addition to who is the client, and I'll show you, um, there's a rule 1.13 that specifically says the lawyer represents the entity. Okay? And to be absolutely clear here, because I just wrote this article on this, um, for purposes of this problem, Dan um, has never been represented individually by this firm for any purpose, because you know sometimes that happens too, right? Okay? And so, you know, let's just say he's never been represented. The law firm's never gotten themselves in any kind of ambiguous representation of Dan or where Dan might think that he was being represented individually by um, the firm. So once we establish that, okay, our client is Wings and Moore, and Kelly is the mouthpiece, the agent, that tells us what to do, okay, what else do you know? The rest of 113 talks about how the lawyer is to act in the best interest of the client, right? The client being the entity. So one of the things that the lawyer is supposed to do, and this of course is, you know, um, uh, you know part of that whole Sarbanes-Oxley debate that, that has been going on for about 10 years, is, well, if the lawyer is supposed to be acting in the best interest of the corporation, that means the lawyer is always supposed to be at least at some level looking at what Callie's saying. And saying, is that reason? Is that is that a, you know? Is everything okay? Now, the way the, the model rule is written, um, you know, you basically have to have to have a, a pretty awful situation. You have to have a situation where the employee, um, the lawyer knows that the employee is engaged in action, intends to act, or refuses to act in a matter related to the representation that is a violation of legal obligation or a violation of law. Okay, you know, some substantial stuff. But the, but the idea that you come away from with regard to 113 is that those, those two words at the end of the second line, best interest, right? Because the whole, the whole message is whatever, you need to be acting in the best interest. And if you were representing an individual, of course you would say that, right? And so sometimes it's, you have to kind of remind the students that as a lawyer, you're still supposed to look after the best interest of the corporation. It's just that the corporation is um, perhaps a sophisticated client. Um, what else do you see? We're representing Wings and Moore. We're drafting an employment agreement for, that's going to um, control Dan, right? We have a relationship with Dan. Yeah. Uh, I, didn't we have an obligation in the beginning to inform, I guess, the agent of the organization before we accepted this uh, job yeah. that we had intrinsically a potential financial conflict of interest and in that we were negotiating the employment contract of the decision maker who would, for the next two years at least, decide what work we got and what we did. Okay, and Kelly's now asked us to lowball the severance package. That's going to take Dan off, right? And. We don't want to take Dan off because in a month, he's going to decide whether we get more work or not, right? So this is where I talk to him about conflict of interest, just the basic idea, okay? Um, you know, this isn't a situation where we've got a, one client directly adverse to another client, but it is a situation where there might be a significant risk that our representation of Wings and Moore is going to be materially limited, okay? And I try to focus the students on those terms so that it kind of becomes second nature. Significant risk, materially limited. Um, and here we're really talking about the personal interest of the lawyer, right? And this is why, it's, you know, I um, have this friend, he's a bit older, he's been a corporate lawyer forever, and he, all, he represents, you know, Kentucky, there's, there's, in Kentucky there's Louisville, and then there's the rest of the state, okay? It's just how the state is. I'm not from Kentucky, so I can, I can be objective a little bit. That really is how it's divided up. Well, this lawyer for years and years has represented all the little banks out in the state. And he regularly has to draft these employment contracts for various bank officials. And the bank wouldn't dare consider going to anybody else because they trust him. He's the Louisville lawyer which carries all kinds of connotations. I guess here in Georgia, it's the Atlanta lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he finds himself in this kind of situation all the time, okay? 
So I said, well, you know, what do you think? I mean, do you ever worry about this? Okay. And he, he says, well, I always have that conversation in the beginning. Okay. Now, what the rule actually says is if you think you have a significant risk of that material limitation, you're supposed to get informed consent from the client. Wings and more, right? It's not enough to have a conversation. You need to get the official informed consent, which, as the rules say, means you have to tell them the risks of what they're doing by, by using you and the alternatives to using you, which, you know, nobody wants to say that, right? No practicing lawyer wants to say what the alternatives are. Um, okay, so we have a conversation in class about that, and usually the students do not see this, okay? They don't see this. Now, in the start book, one of the earliest problems is an employment arrangement, and the person is being hired for the very first time to be um, a hospital administrator, a daily administrator is, is the character's name. And so I do this problem before we hit Adele so that when we get to Adele, they can see, oh yes, same sort of conflict. Even if she's new, she's gonna be in a position of, of power within a month or two. She's gonna have influence over who gets hired or fired so that they can see the conflict in the, um, the, the contract drafting issue uh, or problem. And what I find is later in the semester, they raise these issues now, okay? I don't have to raise them every time anymore. You know, they, after this first conversation, although I feel like I'm beating the, the dead horse because, you know, how many times do I have to go over this? But they get it, okay? And they start raising these sorts of issues and saying, well, I don't know if I would be comfortable here. You know, I don't know if I should do that. And it's like, yes. Because as we all know, out in practice, a conflicts question is usually, um, if you're in a big firm and you have the benefit of a conflicts um, counselor, great. But for a lot of attorneys, that's not, there's nobody like that. It's you yourself and yourself having a conversation at the desk. And so the ability for them to see it and be aware of it, um, I think is, is um, uh, important. Okay, so then I really kind of throw um, a huge curve in here. Um, we revise the draft, and we highlight the changes. And later, Kelly calls, and he sa she says, well, you know, all this is good, um, but you know what? We've been talking over here at Wings and More. We think maybe Dan should sign a non-compete. If he's gonna get a severance package, we want a non-compete to, uh, to tack on to that, okay? Dan is the general counsel. He's a lawyer, right? Now, the reason I put this particular part um, in here, that is about the non-compete, is I do a bunch of CLEs to practicing attorneys, and I kept getting questions about this, and it became clear that the practicing lawyers didn't know what I'm gonna show you, but hang on. Okay, so, um, you know, Callie says we want the non-compete, and she says, you know, here's basically what we want um, him to sign, and if you read, it's your basic non-compete. I got it off of a, uh, a contract out there on the, on the web. Um, it's not outrageous in any way, 12 months. You know, is it gonna be enforceable in some jurisdictions? Yes, in others, no, just depends on where we are, I think. Now, we say, okay, we'll look into it. So we do some research and we discover this rule. It's the law in, I believe, all 50 states. It's, an, uh, let me rephrase that. It's a controlling ethics rule in all 50 states. Um, a lawyer shall not participate in offering or making a partnership, shareholders, operating, employment, or other similar type of agreement that restricts the right of a lawyer to practice after termination of the relationship except an agreement concerning benefits upon retirement. And then there's a second part that says you can't restrict your right to practice as part of the settlement either. Well, what was coming up at these CLEs is I was actually talking about this rule as a res at relating to settlement, but there was always some in-house counsel types in the audience and they would come up and say, does that rule apply to me? because their corporate clients have all their executives signing non-competes. Of course they want their general counsel to, okay? And I thought, you know, 
well, surely, surely somebody catches it along the way, but I went out on the web and no, they don't. That non-compete came from a general counsel's um, contract that's out there on the web that was done within the last 10 years and is a company you would know, okay? So, you know, but let's say we find, we find this rule, okay? And so I asked the students, well, what do we do now? Well, now we go to our background noise, right? Our 1.4 rule about communication. We're supposed to tell Kelly, you know, we can't do this. And in particular, 1.4 part A5, which says, you know, you certainly have to tell the client you can't do something that's going to require you to um, violate a rule of professional responsibility. Kelly is the assistant general counsel. She's going to be violating the rule as well, okay? Um, and so we explain it to Callie, okay? Now suspend reality a little bit, all right? <laughs> Callie says, draft it anyway. Don't highlight it. Let's see if Dan sees it and if he catches the problem. Clearly Callie does not like Dan as boss, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so is there a problem with this conduct? Well, number one, we know we can't draft it that way. It's a violation of 5.6, but suspend reality. What if we did, okay, let's just, um, act as if 5.6 doesn't exist. Could we do something like this where we put a provision in a contract, we don't highlight it, even though we've highlighted other provisions that we change, okay? And we just wait to see if Dan happens to read it? Could we do that? Ooh, let me tell you, the students get so uncomfortable about this, okay? Because some of them want to say it's not nice, okay? And other students want to say, well, but, you know, Dan can read, okay? He could catch it, right? So why do we have to take care of him? So, okay, I tell them about, uh, I remind them, or review with them, right? 4.1, which basically says, you know, you don't make a false statement and you don't fail to disclose a material fact to a third person when disclosure is necessary to avoid assisting a criminal or fraudulent act by a client. The idea would be that Wings and Moore is committing fraud on Dan in this contracting setting. Um, is that what's going on here? Eh, maybe, maybe not, okay? This is one of those times where I definitely wanna try the clicker that I've been hearing about in, in other sessions, you know, have the students vote and see what the result is, because they are all real you know, iffy about it. We know that a lawyer cannot counsel a client or assist a client in conduct the lawyer knows to be fraud, okay? That can't happen. So if what Kelly wants us to do is fraud, then clearly we can't do it. In between 4.1, 1.2, and then also 8.4, a lawyer's not supposed to engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. I referred to this as my kindergarten rule, okay? Um, I always tell the students, you know, so much of PR really is what you learned in kindergarten. You don't take other people's things, you don't lie to the teacher, you don't lie to your friends. I mean, you know, um, engaging in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. So we get a really lively conversation about that, and this gets at I have the students do a couple of projects where they have to work with each other and exchange information, negotiate a little bit, and I see the effect of this in terms of what they're comfortable saying to each other, you know, and how they deal with each other. Or at least I, I think that's why they're doing what they're doing, is that they're more aware of, of this issue. And you may say, well, no, I, I really don't think that what's going on there amounts to assisting a fraud. Um, and I'll leave you with, with, with one thing. Um, there's a, a case out of um, Wisconsin, um, Wisconsin Court of Appeals, 1999. So a fairly recent case. And here's what happened in that case. Employment contract um, negotiation going on between um, corporation and executive. Executive had a lawyer, corporation had a lawyer. Drafts go back and forth. Every time there's a change, the change is highlighted, okay? The parties get to the point, and the lawyers, they get to the point where they think they've, they're at the end of it, okay? And a final draft is created by the lawyer for the president, or lawyer for the corporation, 
The lawyer for the corporation forwards the mat, forwards the contract, the last draft, to the president of the corporation, who was his contact. That was his, the agent of the corporation. The president, last minute, looks at it and says, I don't want this guy to be making this much money. And he changes a provision in the compensation section. And you all know in these employment arrangements, the compensation section is never so-and-so gets $500,000. It's never like that. It's so-and-so gets 2% of the this or the that or whatever is greater. You know, and it goes on for pages sometimes in terms of how you're supposed to figure it out. And it's a great, a great example of um, sometimes having to draft formulas to figure out how you're supposed to figure out compensation. So, okay, the president makes a change. It goes over to the employee and the, empl the executive and the executive's attorney. They look through it. There's nothing highlighted. They don't read it, and he signs it. Executive signs it, okay? Later on, one would presume about the time that first check's due, um, the executive discovers that the compensation he thought he was getting is not what's in that document. Okay. And he um, brings an action that, uh, to have the contract set aside on the basis of fraud and misrepresentation. Okay. And the Wisconsin Court of Appeals said that it at least is a matter that should go to, could, should get past summary judgment. Okay. That if in fact there had been this process of highlighting, and if in fact there wasn't highlighting on this particular item that perhaps that action outweighed um, the executive and the executive's counsel any duty to read, that they were misled. Okay? So I throw that out to you as something else to think about in the context of you know, what Callie proposes for the lawyer to do. So, you know, end of the story is, okay, we do this, and then we move on with our, um, with our other contract um, exercises, and I at least, you know, maybe I'm projecting, but I at least think that the conversation is better later, um, more sophisticated in terms of responsibilities to the client, what the role of the lawyer is, that sort of thing. All right, so feel free to use whatever you might be able to use, all right? Pure laziness on my part, but I was wondering if you had the site for the Benihana case and the site for the Wisconsin case. Sure. Yes, actually, the site for the Wisconsin case at the very um, it's in the in the handout that you got right here, and it's at the very end of my materials, the last little paragraph. There's helpful sources, and it's the Hennig case. I'm even lazier than you and didn't put it in there, but I did bring it, so that counts for something. <laughs> it's 906 A second 114. Thank you very much for coming. <coughs> you. No. No, that was a great girl. What was it? Was it 906A2nd what? 906A2nd 114. I had to tell Miriam um, graduated from Emory and so did I, and the classrooms have changed. Well, the flashbacks, like, so we're all like, <laughs> that's why we're so nervous. It's like, oh, I'm going to pass that. <laughs> <laughs> and now all our teachers are here and they want us to call them by their first names. No, what? Do that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so I can't call them anything. Please call me Frank. Okay. No. No. <laughs> <laughs>